Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Natalie and we are so happy to worship with you this morning. God tells us in Matthew 18, 20 that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them and we all come together every week to celebrate him, praise him for all that he has done because he is holy, he is worthy, and he deserves our praise. So let's all stand and sing this out together.
suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified and were the His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountaintops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. We lift him up. out with us. Because you give a life, you are love, 
Let me pray for us. Father, thank you 
we're here for you today. Thank you for waking us. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for giving us an entire day where we can love you back and love others that you put along our path. We just wanted to acknowledge you today as we worship you, as we come together in community. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Greg. Welcome to our favorite morning of the week. Why are Sunday mornings uh, so important? Why do they matter so much? Well, it's because of something that happened on a Sunday morning a couple of thousand years ago. Jesus' followers were still reeling from the fact that he had been put to death. That is until they discovered that his tomb was empty. Could it be true? I mean, Jesus had indicated to them several times over the years as he taught them that something like this was going to happen. But at the time, his followers never could quite grasp what it all meant. It is true, and it's a truth that we continue to celebrate and find great hope in all of these years later. It's hard to believe that Easter is just a week away, and we don't want you to miss any opportunity at all uh, to join us for a great morning or afternoon of celebration, depending on which service you choose. We're going to offer you four opportunities, four identical services, Saturday, March 30th, either 4 or 6 p.m., Sunday morning at 9.30 or 11.15 a.m., our normal service times. And if you've been thinking about getting baptized, Easter Sunday is a great way and day to do that. We normally have gathered at the pond in the past. But this year, we're going to be doing baptisms in our service, which means so many more of you are going to be able to witness those and celebrate with those that are making that decision. We'd love to talk to you more about it. If you have questions, just go to the help desk, and they can guide you to the prayer room. No pressure at all. We just want to see if there are any questions that we can get answered. And if you want to be baptized, we'd love for you to register. Just go to southland.church slash Easter for all things Easter and including the way to get registered. Um, We're also going to be inviting people to grab one of these cards. This is a great invitation opportunity for you. We have stacks of these at the help desk. We'd love you to take a handful. But here's what I would encourage you to do. Please just don't leave these passively someplace. Make sure you use these as a personal invitation. I've actually found invitations from other places around the area this week. And so let's make these personal. The, The most impacting invitation is a personal invitation, but we're providing these to make that easier for you. There's a QR code on the back that anybody can scan, and it'll take them to southland.church slash Easter. Hopefully, you'll take advantage of that. I had an opportunity to speak to our high school students a couple of Wednesdays ago, and it was a great opportunity for me to be able to say to them, you all are doing an amazing job reflecting Jesus in your schools, to your friends, and to your families. And they happened to be doing a food drive that night where they were collecting food items for our backpack ministry. I said, well, here they are. They're not only serving well, but they're giving well as well. If you don't know what our backpack program is all about, we'd love to tell you more. It's just very simply the way we collect food items and we partner with our schools to get those food items to kids that need them. There are specific food items that are required, and there are these lists that are available on the backpack bins located around the concourse. You can also go to southland.church slash backpack to find more information, even about how to serve but also what food items are most helpful. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. We want to finish the year strong uh, with our backpack food ministry uh, to our schools. Well, one of the things I was concerned about when I went to speak to our students was how attentive are they going to be? I thought the room would be sort of noisy with a lot of distractions. I was wrong. Those high school students were dialed in. They really wanted to learn, and I was so impressed by that. So let's follow their lead today as we minimize distractions here in the auditorium. Silence those cell phones, refrain from conversations, and if your little ones are having a rough time, feel free to just take them to the concourse or to one of our great children's ministry environments. We're continuing a powerful teaching series that we're in right now called The Verdict is In, it's going to carry us through Easter. John Weiss is with us to continue that message, so let's go ahead and join in with our other campuses as John comes to teach us today.
Well, for several years, I had the privilege of uh, coaching Little League baseball teams. And one summer, we were uh, traveling in the South playing in tournaments. And uh, we stayed in a particularly rough hotel one time after some tournament games. And the boys really wanted to swim. And so I told the parents, hey, I got it all chaperoned. So I'm sitting by the pool watching the sunset. Guys are having a good time. And these two men approach us. And they're not associated with our team, and they're carrying this big white cooler, and they plop down in the chairs on either side of me, so I introduce myself. And they start hammering the beer, and they empty all the beer out, then they turn to tequila, and after all the tequila was gone, man, the alcohol had just loosened up all their inhibitions. <laughs> and they said to me, hey, we're, we're drug dealers. And... We're on the run from the police. We've been zigzagging between Tennessee and Kentucky, hiding out in these kind of hotels. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. So uh, one of them stands up and takes his tank top off. And as he's pulling it over his head, I noticed this huge gaping hole where his armpit's supposed to be. And he saw me see it. And so he said, yeah, my old lady stabbed me. And uh, I said, yeah, that happens to me all the time. I get it. Marriage is hard. And not to be outdone, his, his buddy pulls his shirt up, and he had been shot at a young age with a shotgun. And so he'd had all these surgeries, and he goes, I don't have a belly button. And um, <laughs> it just got more and more interesting as the evening wore on. But in this kind of sober, clear-minded uh, part of the conversation, one of them said, hey, what do you think we should do? And I wanted to say, man, I like my armpit and my belly button. Don't shoot me or stab me. Let's start there. But I just told them what I tell everyone who's facing a mountain of mistakes, which is who you are today is not who you have to be tomorrow. And I told him about how Jesus had radically changed my life in more ways than I could count, and he could do the same for them. And one of them looked at me, and he said, man, I can't see that far. I can't see tomorrow. And that absolutely crushed me, because I thought all he sees is his past. When all Jesus sees when he looks at him is a hopeful future. This is why Paul said in Galatians chapter five, plant your feet firmly in the freedom that Jesus has won for you. All too often, I think we make the mistake of trading this freedom that Jesus died to give us for a different kind of freedom that's spelled this way. Now I'll own it, like I'll own it, I'll personalize this. When I was younger, I was book smart. Good grades, scored well on tests, but behaviorally, I was dumb until my early 20s, and most of my fun was at my own expense. I'll share with you, I have two older brothers, wonderful guys, but when I was a kid, I just didn't know when to shut it down. I was always messing with them. And I went through this season where when they would go in to take a shower, I would sneak in there and throw cold water on them. And so I knew at some point it's going to catch up to me, and they caught up to me one day, and they loved tying me to things. They, they, they would tie me to car bumpers, basketball goals, didn't matter, jump ropes. And so they decided to tie me to the maple tree in our front yard this particular day. But to add to it, to teach me a better lesson, they pulled my pants down around my ankles, and I'm just standing there helplessly, pulled my shirt up over my head, and then they gave me a pink belly, okay? Guys in the room know what this is. If you slap someone hard enough, it leaves a handprint. So I'm standing there, and I can't see, I, can't, I don't know what's going on in front of me, and a car stops, feels sorry for me, and this lady gets out and she unties me. Now, I tell you that to say this, I deserved it. I totally deserved it. Like the punishment more than fit the crime when it came to my childhood. Hold on to that thought for just a little bit. Towards the end of his life, Jesus is in an intimate moment with his best friends. And he says, no man, it's gonna happen. There's no stop in this train. The Romans are going to crucify me, and when they do, each and every one of you is going to abandon me in my hour of need. And Peter looks at him, one of his closest buddies, and he says, even if I have to die with you, I, I, I will never abandon you. And later that night, middle of the night, Jesus is on trial, and the trials are not going well at all. Jesus is inside, Peter's outside in the little courtyard area. And someone started a fire to warm their hands. And so here's Peter, hood pulled up, doing his best to blend in, doing his best to distance himself from Jesus. And someone around the fire says, I recognize you. You were with him. You're one of him. Someone else says, no, your accent. You're not from this part of the world. Where? Three times 
Three times Peter denies ever knowing Jesus. And afterwards it says he goes outside the city and he cried and he cried and he cried. Why? Because all Peter could see in that moment was the immediate past, if nothing else. But what he didn't see is that Jesus was working right then and there for a very bright future. Let me illustrate it this way. In any relationship any of us are in, when there's a problem, when someone says something or does something that hurts our feelings, it creates this lack of communication continuity in the relationship. And and then the bond is threatened between us and that person because there's now this relational knot. And human tendency and pride and selfishness is we dig in our heels stubbornly and we move away from one another. We move in the opposite direction of one another. And when we do that, the knot tightens. The problem exacerbates. But it's been my experience personally and professionally when people move towards one another in the midst of conflict. Suddenly, the knot becomes a little bit easier to undo. Jesus is going to model that for us in his friendship with Peter. Peter didn't deserve it, but he needed it. And that's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He's always looking for ways to undo relational knots. So after the resurrection, Jesus could have gone a totally different direction. He goes to a lake. I love this this picture. He's on the lake cooking breakfast. Little open fire, making sure the fish gets turned over so it doesn't burn. Shows us his humanity. Meanwhile, offshore, Peter's fishing with his buddies, and when he sees who's on the shore, he doesn't wait for the boat to get rowed. It says he jumps in, and he swims to the beach, and can't you see him walking up there, dripping wet, out of breath? You know what he wants to say. Jesus, I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me in that moment. I was terrified. But before he can say anything, Jesus says, hey, man, do you you love me? And Peter's response is so telling. Yes, Lord, you know. Man, you know. You know I love you. Three times Jesus will ask him that question because three times Peter had denied him. And don't miss that. That's an important nugget there. That means Jesus has more forgiveness than we have sin. It's so critical for our hearts. But I want you to see it in the original language because it's utterly profound. The first time Jesus asked him, it looked something like this. Peter, do you agapo me? Do you love me with a divinely sourced kind of love? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. Love you like a brother. I love you like a friend. And two times, that's the back and forth. And it's almost as if Jesus recognizes He's asking too much of this guy. So Jesus, the third time, meets Peter right where he is, and he says, hey, buddy, do you, do you fillet owe me? Yes, Lord, you know that I fillet owe you. I want you to see what Jesus didn't do. He didn't rewind the tape back to the courtyard. What were you thinking? I needed you. He didn't browbeat him. He didn't pile shame on him. He didn't lead him on a guilt trip. All Jesus wanted to know is if Peter loved him because Jesus loved Peter. And so we see this beautiful, grace-centered progression in all of Jesus' friendships that we need to imitate, where forgiveness follows, free, forgiveness follows failure and freedom follows forgiveness. So we take our worst to Jesus, he gives us his best, and the minute we accept that forgiveness, I've experienced this, there's freedom. Freedom begins to boil over, bubble over in our hearts. This is why the psalmist overwhelmed said, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. Is there anyone here today who is grateful for that like I am? It's overwhelming. When I learned what Matt Lauer had done, I wrote him a letter. Wife left him. NBC fired him. The nation turned its back on him. Rightfully so. The guy deserved that and probably more. I just wanted him to know that God doesn't treat people the way people treat people. So I made it a regular part of my life to write letters to people who fail. I wrote one to Mike Tyson after he blew through $300 million. Britney Spears shaved her head and hit a paparazzi member with an umbrella, wrote her a letter. I don't know if these people receive the letters or read the letters. That doesn't matter to me. I just want, I want them to know if they do that God doesn't treat people the way people treat people. And so this is my letter to you. I don't know what you've done. And frankly, I've heard it all. It doesn't matter to me. I love you. But more importantly, God does. And friend, forgiveness 
But not just forgiveness, freedom is on the table for you. I want you to have it. Take you back to my brothers. Man, they've been good to me, really good to me. My oldest brother is uh, six six, and I've always looked up to him, literally and figuratively. He used to pick me up so I could dunk a basketball and feel what it was like to hang on a rim. One time he put me up on his shoulders and he had me by the ankles. He said, do you trust me? I got a hold of his hair. I'm like, yeah, I trust you. And he hops up on a skateboard and he rides down this hill. And my goodness, it could, yeah, yeah. <laughs> could have ended in an emergency room or a funeral home, but it didn't. It was awesome. <laughs> it's the first time my mom's probably hearing about that right now. <laughs> but my favorite thing was I would go to him and he'd grab my hands and I'd get up on top of his feet. And he'd take these big steps with those long legs. And I would feel what it was like to be a giant. My brothers are great people. Love them to death. Jesus is always a bigger, better, older brother. And he wants to give you this vantage point of life that you can't get on your own. He wants to take you places you can't get on your own. So here's the challenge. I'm challenging you to leave the lower middle ground that most of us spend our existence in for a higher, better ground. And it's a, it's a trade-off between sinful nature and spiritual nature. See, Peter was straddling the fence. He lived in the middle ground most of his life trying to stay in both worlds, and you can't do it. You can't. Because the sinful nature always leads to death. The spiritual nature always leads to life. Sinful nature robs us of joy, whereas the spiritual nature feeds us with joy. Sinful nature focuses on failure in your past. And the spiritual nature focuses on forgiveness and your future. Dr. Henry Cloud, years ago in a book, nailed it when he said this, part of maturity is when you can let go of one wish in order to have another. The immature mind wants it all. But the most valuable things, great marriage, great career, financial independence, vibrant faith, come with a cost. And you have to make hard choices. I've seen it a million times with people. They want to stay in this middle ground to please the world and God, and you can't please both. And so they'll say things like, well, I really want to fit in those jeans by summer, but I don't want to eat well and I don't want to exercise. Or, you know what, I want to get out of debt and I want to have some money in the bank for a rainy day, but I also want to have all the gadgets, drive a car I don't need and wear clothes I don't need. This is why our leader said you cannot worship two gods at the same time. I heard an older, wiser person say it this way, an eagle that chases two rabbits at the same time catches neither. The same is true for us. Let this Easter season be the defining moment where you take the step. Don't wait for the boat to get to shore. He's waiting, and the invitation is on the table for you. I saw a picture recently. Hikers and hunters in the state of Colorado kept sending pictures of this bull elk with a car tire around its neck. For two or three years, it was seen on different trails as people were walking by, and finally Fish and Wildlife got involved. They said, man, if we don't do something, that tire is eventually going to restrict blood flow in that animal, and it could cut off circulation. So they tranquilized the bull elk. They dart it, and they're able to gently remove the tire, and the bull elk wakes up and moves on, and to the surprise of the game wardens, regular tire weighs about 20 pounds. But this one, over time, had accumulated a ton of debris. Dirt, and mud, and rocks, and leaves, and sticks were jammed in there. This thing weighed in excess of 30 pounds. So the person said, you know, it's interesting. For half that bull elk's life, it's just been walking around with an extra 30 pounds it wasn't designed to carry. I mean, isn't that our story? The world probably means well at times, but it hands us this stuff that's supposed to make our life better. But then we wake up one day and we just feel heavy. We feel weighed down. I'll illustrate it in an innocuous way, but how many of you at Halloween time when you were a kid ever got pixie sticks? Anyone? Little cavity creators? Yeah. So on a side note, I've got a buddy whose son has a ton of energy, and a few Christmases ago I mailed him a pack of these and a six-pack of Mountain Dew. And a little relational knot between me and his dad. We'll work it out. But the point is this. This is what I remember from my childhood, and yet this is the new pixie stick. There's not any sugar left in the Dominican Republic. It's all right here in this one tube. 
But isn't this the mindset of our world? Bigger is always better. You need a bigger house. You need a bigger bank account. You need more clothes, more vacations, more of this, more of that. And yet we're all savvy enough, and we have real life examples in front of us called rock stars and movie stars. And we can see it doesn't satisfy. I, I don't know when it happened to Peter. I don't know the precise moment. But I know that denial in the courtyard played a part. At some point, Peter gets free from his past. And before he's crucified by the Romans, he leaves behind this incredible statement for us. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us in the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. In other words, guys, this isn't our home. This world we're living in right now, it's not our home, so don't sell your soul in an attempt to satisfy it in a way that it won't. Years ago, I was preaching out in California at a church, and I was coming back, and I was in LAX, the airport in Los Angeles, and handing the lady behind the counter my driver's license. And I could tell just from body language and facial expression, she's not had a good day. She doesn't look at me, just typing. And then she looks up and she says, uh, you don't have a seat on this flight. And so I thought, man, this can go one way or the other. So I was trying to be nice, and I said, oh, even though I have a ticket? And she said, you don't have a ticket. And I wanted to, you know, prove my point, but I thought this isn't the right time. So I said, hey, can you, can you get me home? And so she started typing. <laughs> she looks up. She goes, I can get you to St. Louis. I said, well, that's the thing. Um, on a map, I don't really live in St. Louis. I live over here in Kentucky, and there's Illinois and Indiana. So the supervisor walks up, and the supervisor looks at me and says, is there a problem? And I said, no, ma'am, I don't have a problem I have a reservation, or at least I thought I did on this flight. Can you, can you get me home? And so they work it out, and I have to land in two or three other cities that night and get home in the middle of the night, but I at least got to sleep in my own bed. And I've thought about that since. I don't have a problem. I have a reservation. And so do you. And the reason we do is because of a technicality in Scripture that we don't teach on enough called a pardon. You've been pardoned. I've been pardoned. This is technically different than a not guilty verdict in a court of law. Let me explain. Last year in the country of Honduras, they rounded up 75,000 criminals, drug dealers, murderers, thieves. The streets were overwhelmed with crime. They decided to clean things up, locked all these men up in these super cramped cells, they gave them two meals a day and no access to the outside world. Now imagine for just a brief moment if you're in one of those cells, you. And years in, a warden comes to the cell and says your name and says, hey, someone wants to take your place. You get to go home. Oh, you'd be overwhelmed. You'd be overjoyed. You'd be shocked, but surprised. Yeah, but you would be excited. So you step outside, and you can't imagine if this is really true. Then they give you your street clothes and what was in your pockets when you walked in, and you're beginning to realize, oh, man, this is happening. And then you get outside the prison, and you're on the other side of the wall. You're almost scot-free, and the warden says, this isn't the end of it. Not only did the person want to take your place, but they gave me this envelope to give to you. And so you open the envelope, and inside is a set of keys and a map and a deed to a mansion in a beautiful surrounding like you can't comprehend. And you look at the warning, he goes, no, it's true, it's yours. The person not only wanted to set you free, they also wanted to bless you. That's what Jesus did. That's a pardon. We don't deserve it, and we know it. Guilty as charged. We've all broken all of God's laws. But we've not only been set free, we've been blessed beyond anything we can imagine. So friend, do me a favor. Quit living like you're on the run. Quit sleeping with one eye open and wondering when's your past gonna catch up with you? When are people gonna figure out I'm a fake, I'm a fraud? Welcome. <laughs> We're all in that boat. And he came to let us know that who we used to be is not who we have to be. He has the power. And he proved it to set us free.
Albert Race Sample. <laughs> Never heard of this guy till this week. Raised by a prostitute. His mom's name was Emma. And she would beat him and she would neglect him and she would blame him every day for her terrible life. And at 11 years of age, he had had enough. He ran away. His teenage years, he fought anyone who would, he, anyone who would get in his way. He would just, in anger, lash out. Finally, the state of Texas had had enough, and they locked him up for 30 years. In prison, he fought other prisoners, prison guards. It didn't matter. The anger was there. The sadness was there, and he didn't know what to do with it. 16 years into his incarceration, 16 years, they didn't know what else to do, so they put him in a place called the tomb. Basement of this prison, four by eight foot cell, made of cement. No bed, no toilet, no sink, no windows. One biscuit a day and one cup of water a day. And at the very end at night, they would give him this slop they called soup. 28 days into his sent in the, in the tomb, he broke. Utter desperation, he didn't know what else to do. Here's how he described it. Slumped, exhausted on the slab, I covered my face with both hands and cried out, help me, God, help me. Ray of light between my fingers appeared. Slowly uncovering my face, the whole cell was illuminated like a 40-watt bulb turned on. The soft light soothed me, and I no longer was afraid. Engulfed by a presence, I felt it reassuring me. It comforted me. I, I breathed freely. I had never felt such well-being, so good in all my life. Safe loved. The voice within talked through the pit of my belly. You are not an animal. You are a human being. Don't you worry about a thing. After that, God was real. He found me in the abyss of the burning hell, uplifted and fed my hungry soul and breathed new life into my nostrils. When he was taken out of the tomb, by law, prison officials had to weigh him physically Mr. Sample had gained five pounds on a biscuit a day. But more importantly, he was lighter emotionally and spiritually. The sadness of his childhood, the anger of his adulthood, the debris had been removed by Jesus. So he surrendered to Jesus, gave his life to Jesus, and wouldn't you know it, the state of Texas finally let him out. Let me read you the final sentences that caught my attention. He left prison with $10 in his pocket, educated himself, got a job working for the governor, worked his way up to becoming a probation officer, served on the state bar of Texas as a division head, was named the outstanding crime prevention citizen of Texas in 1981, and here it is, received a full pardon. Oh, goodness. I can't wait to meet this man. But more importantly, I can't wait to meet Jesus who makes that all possible. Pardon we don't deserve, but all of us desperately need. Man, as we get our hearts and our heads ready for Easter next Sunday, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for lifting us up on your shoulders, uh, for giving us a new view, a better view, and from your vantage point right now, I just want you to see a grateful church, your sons and daughters, thankful, overwhelmed with joy because we know what we've done. We know the way we've treated ourselves. We know the way we've treated others. We know what we deserve, and yet, and yet, you still love us. You love us in spite of us, and you refuse to give up on us even when the whole world does. Thank you for that patience. Thank you for that resolve as a dad to see past us and to see what our potential really is. God, we're gonna turn our palms over at this communion time and surrender to you again and let you know that we're here to be used, to be poured out. God, we just want everyone that we meet to encounter this life-changing love. So God, infuse this church with your grace. Protect us from Satan. And give us the opportunity and the ability this week to tell people the reason we're different is because Jesus met us in the tomb. We pray this in his name. Amen.
well, we had a problem. And we stood there not knowing what to do. And then Jesus stepped over, kind of gently pushed us to the side, stood in our place, and then willingly took on our punishment that we deserved. In doing so, he offered us a pardon, forgiveness. And that sealed for us a reservation. I love the imagery behind that. And I'll apply it in one more way today uh, as we're getting ready to experience communion together. There's a reservation that we all have. There's a seat reserved for you around a table. And it's a table we symbolically gather around every week as a church. And it's our way of remembering what Jesus did in order to pardon us. So we eat a piece of bread and we drink some juice around this table. And with gratitude, we remember what he's done for us. Now, this is new to you. Don't feel any pressure to participate. But there's nothing more that we love to do than to tell people about Jesus and what he came to do for us. If we can do that, members of our prayer team will be down front. They'd be happy to talk to you more about it. There's going to be some scriptures on the screen that you can follow along as well if you choose to do that. But this is just a great opportunity for us to just sit and just be with this idea of what Jesus has done for us. And then let's leave this place again, walking in freedom. Let's take a few minutes to think about that now. Creation knows the voice that spoke into the void, the breath that brought the dust to life, and sang the stars to fall. The darkness fears the voice. That drove it back before And though the night is long I know your light Will drive it back once more One word from
This is Haley, and just talking to Haley a minute ago, um, she's just really excited. She loves Jesus, and she's really excited to make this decision because she doesn't want to be lukewarm. She wants to be all in for him and live her life for him, and she wants to share that with other people. So can you guys encourage her this morning for this decision? Well, Haley, you can repeat after me. Say, I believe, I believe with all my heart, with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Well, based on your faith in Jesus and your confession, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. What a great way to end the service. Just a reminder, we have a prayer team up front that would love to pray with you and for you. We hope to see you back next week as we celebrate Easter. Bring a friend with you. Have a good rest of your day. We'll see you next week.